for funding from Unlocking Curious Minds and got it, much to my surprise. So Janine asked me just to share with you some tips from um, how I apply for funding in the process that I used. So I prepared this PowerPoint um, just because then um, it's easier for me to not forget what I wanted to say. Um, so firstly, a bit of background. I'm not a teacher, I'm a scientist. Um, and over the past 10 years, I've spent a lot of time facilitating people from industry going into schools to promote their STEM-based careers. And that's the basis that I've used in applying for funding. So I wondered why Janine asked me to do this, bearing in mind some of the teachers online have applied for funding. Um, and the reason is that um, in two of the three events that I've run, I've actually involved teachers who've been on the STLP. So um, in 2016 and 2017, a teacher who had been on the STLP developed and ran a workshop as part of our event. Um, and in 2017, a teacher who'd been on an STLP at Plant and Food um, helped the scientists at Plant and Food develop the resources and activities for the workshop that we ran. And that teacher was actually part of the workshop during the event. Um, so that's my involvement with STPL, STLP teachers. So um, the other thing to be aware of is I initially wrote this presentation a couple of weeks ago and then the call for proposals for this year came out and they're different. They change them every year um, and I haven't read them thoroughly from start to finish yet. So I know there are some differences, but I don't know all of them. So don't be surprised if you find some of what I've said is actually no longer relevant. Hopefully not a hell of a lot. So to start with some hints, um, when I first wrote my first application, there was no useful info on the UCM website. There now is. Um, so that's a good place to start with some guidance. Um, you can't write a proposal in one day or one week. Um, last year, someone actually contacted me the day before um, proposals were due and said, can you give me some guidance on how to write it? And I said, no because it's impossible to do it in one day. Um, if you're asking scientists and technologists to take on extra work in addition to what they normally do, they need time to decide um, if they're available to do it, when during the year they can do it, and they have to get approval from their managers. And that can take quite a few weeks. So I start working on my proposal as soon as the call for proposals is released, and I've already started working on the one for this year, even though the um, portal doesn't open till tomorrow. So the other thing to think about is you're submitting your project plan in September, but if you get funding, you won't actually get any money until February at the earliest. And it could be things have changed and interim prices change. Um, the first year I did it, a couple of the scientists who um, were going to be involved were no longer available. So I had to explain to MB um, the changes that I'd made and significant changes. And that wasn't an issue. I just had to explain to them why I'd made those changes. The other thing is if you aren't really a user of the MB portal, um, register early on in the process because it takes a few days for them to process your application. Um, the other thing is I've asked heaps of questions of the UCM staff and they're really helpful in answering them, but you don't get a response immediately. So just be aware that it can take them a few days to respond. Um, so the first thing I do is I read the call for proposals very, very carefully because there's a lot of detail in there that can affect what you can apply for, what you can't apply for, and how you might word what your application is. So as soon as the call for proposals is released, I download it, I print it off because I can read paper much better than I can read um, online. And I read through it very carefully, including the fine print. There's a lot of detail in the fine print. I highlight key issues and I make notes about what I'm proposing to do and what it says I can do and I can't do. Um, I note the closing date and time. Time's really important because the closing time is actually noon, not 5 p.m., which you'd expect. Um, and I plan to complete my submission several working days prior to the deadline in case something goes wrong because the first year I applied something did go wrong. I wasn't sure what to do. Um, unfortunately, I had two days up my sleeve to sort it out. Important to note that there are two deadlines this year, one for registering 
and the other for submitting your proposal. The other thing is to note is deadline means deadline, that once they close it off, that's it, tough luck. So um, if you do something at 12.01, it's too late. So the format, the, the way that I go about it is, I find the proposal template really difficult to follow. It's not a format that I use in my work. So what I do is I actually write my proposal in a format that I'm familiar with, and then I copy the information into the UCM template. That's a long way around, but I can't do it just using the template. So the first thing I do is collect all the information I need for my proposal um, and write it in the format that I'm comfortable with. And this is the format that works for me. So the first thing I do is I write an outline of what I want to do, who's going to attend the event, um, what they're going to do during the event, and I summarize the scientists and technologists who will be involved and what they will do. Then, so for me, that's like the introduction or the background. Um, then I go into the detail of why do I want to do it and how am I going to justify MB giving me some money to do it. So I outline the, outline the current situation, the issues and needs of the target group, how my event is going to address these issues and needs, what are the impacts and outcomes I want to achieve, and how am I going to measure these? So am I going to do Survey Monkey, or what else am I going to do to measure it, that I've made a difference? So then um, I write a detailed project plan um, describing the target group in detail, what year are these students, um, what schools are they coming from, where in Hawke's Bay are they from. Um, I describe in detail what they're going to do. I've always done activities with them. What are those activities going to be? When do I plan to do it? When during the year? What time of day? If it makes a difference? Is it weekends? Is it school holidays? Where will it take place? Is it going to be in the school classroom? Is it going to be that they're going to visit scientists in their workplace? Um, I address ethics and health and safety issues. And then I describe the scientists and technologists who are going to be involved, who they work for, what they do in their jobs, and what they're actually going to do as part of the event that I want funding for. Then I talk about any other organizations who are going to contribute to my event and how might they contribute. Um, and if it's for senior secondary students, you have to talk about, it has to be linked to the curriculum, so you have to describe how you're going to do that. <clears throat> and then I work on the budget. Um, just a few hints for the budget. If you're writing your budget in September, your project won't actually start until February the following year at the earliest, and it might not end until December or even later if you ask for permission to finish it later. So it could finish more than 15 months after you did the budget, and it's likely your costs will change in that time. So I include a contingency budget to allow for those changes. So I've got some money that I can use to spend where I wasn't expecting to spend it. Um, you don't have to budget to the nearest dollar. Um, in the final report, MB requires you to explain significant differences between the budget and actual costs. So you get some freedom there. And note that the budget is excluding GST which is, for me, not something I'm used to working with. So once I've gathered all the information that I need and I've written it in a format that I'm comfortable with, I go and reread the call for proposals, including the fine print, to check that I've got all the information that they've asked for. And certainly for the past three years, I've discovered that I hadn't. There was something I missed out on or something that I wanted to do some more research on and gather some more info. And if that's the case, I collect that and record that and add it to my document. So then um, what I do is I actually draft my proposal offline because when you use the template in the IMS portal online, you can't save a section if you exceed the word limits, and I always do. So what I do is I um, prepare a draft offline on my laptop using the format of the templates that they give you. Um, and then I take the information that I've gathered and I copy it into the relevant part, um, relevant section of the template. Um, some of the info that I've gathered is actually relevant to more than one section. So I choose what to say in each section based on what UCM asks for that section. And that's always in the fine print. And the really important thing is the word limits. 
So I usually have more words than I'm permitted. So once I've copied everything, all the information I've gathered into the template, then I go back and juggle the words to meet the word limit so that I say everything I want to say, but I don't go over the word limits. And for me, that's the hardest part because quite often I have to edit what I've said to be more concise. So once I've got a draft document that I'm comfortable with, I've said everything I want to say, um, I've met their criteria for words, um, I then go on to the IMS um, online portal and I enter all the information into that. And the good thing about that is you can do it in stages. You don't have to sit down and do it all in one go. You can do it um, piecemeal, come back to it, think about it until you're happy with it. Um, and it gives you lots of opportunities to review what you've written. You can print it off. You can send it to other people to check. There's all sorts of things that you can do. Um, for me, I find it easier to do it piecemeal. Um, also, I like getting parts done a little bit at a time. So I start entering the info into the portal about a week before the deadline um, in case I have problems as well. And once again, in the past, I've had problems and I needed some help from MB to sort them out. Um, I plan to complete my submission several days before the deadline um, because I like to sleep on things. I like to complete them and then go away and think about them and think if there's a better way of saying it or if I've covered everything. Um, so it gives me a couple of days to check that I'm happy with it before I actually submit it. And then once you've submitted it, you then um, the portal acknowledges that you've done it and then you wait two months for the outcome. So that's basically the process I go through. Um, I just need to acknowledge um, the Hawke's Bay branch of the Royal Society pays me to actually submit the application. So I needed to get their permission to share these hints with you because basically it's their IP. So that's me done. Has anybody got any questions? Don't forget to switch on your microphone if you want to ask Jenny some questions. Who would like to go first? Deafening silence. What are the sorts of um, pitfalls and errors that you can fall into easily, Jenny? Um, I think the, the most difficult part for me is actually reading the call for proposals really carefully because there is so much information in there and it's easy to miss out parts of what they want. So they're very specific about what you can apply for funding to cover, what you can't get funding to cover. Um, and for me, that was the most difficult. I guess also because I don't work in a school, um, I'm not a teacher that's different way of thinking. Um, the way they've written it is actually, for me, some of the language is really difficult to understand as well. So I think um, this year I've sent two questions off to them to say, please, can you clarify this for me? And they're really helpful. Um, but yeah, it's reading, reading what they want, understanding what they want, um, and how what I want to do fits into what they want. Mm. For me, that's the most difficult part. And I guess the, um, the form and the um, information on it is fairly densely written. It is. Um, and the, yeah, the key thing is to read the fine detail because that, they're very clear about what they want. Um, and yeah, you, 300 words and 200 words is very little when you want to describe it. I guess it depends what you're doing and whether the event that you want funding for is just um, like a one-off event. The first time I did it, I had 10 mini workshops and trying to explain 10 mini workshops in 300 words was a nightmare. So um, yeah, it is, you need to be so concise. Yeah. Anybody else got any questions? I've hogged it a bit. Yeah, Jenny, what kind of what kind of things do you use as evidence to show the effectiveness of your project? I've always done Survey Monkey. So um, Unlocking I'm Curious Minds has a survey that they ask you to send the students. And it starts by saying you don't have to answer this. And a teacher told me that's not a good thing to say to a student <laughs> because then they won't. So I've, they offer the, you can go to them and ask them to add your questions to their survey. Also their survey starts with like a half a page of information 
and I think that puts students off. So I actually have my own survey, which I develop. The one for students has five questions. I might also send, send surveys to the teachers who participate. Um, I think theirs is a bit more detailed. I think it has seven questions. Um, and I also, so in every event I've run, I have several science providers um, and I also send a survey to them. So I get feedback from the people who run the activities for me, the teachers who accompany the students and the students who attend. And obviously I get different levels of, of responses. Um, this year I got, I think, 50% um, of the students responded. They were year 10 and 11. Last year, about 70% of the students responded. So are the events you're running one day events or are they longer term events? So all the ones, so the, this year it was a two day event um, for year 10 and 11 students. It was STEM and horticulture. They spent the first day at Plant and Food Research doing hands-on activities with the scientists. And on day two, they went to visit an orchard and a pack house to see how that science was applied in industry. Um, and I sent the um, Survey Monkey survey the following week in the hope that they would have reflected a little bit about what they'd learnt and seen, and then they could give me some feedback. Um, last year, the students had a choice of three events. Um, Two of those were one day long, and the third one was two days. And the first year I applied, I did 10 half day workshops over the space of, can't remember if it was two or four days, whatever it was, don't do it. It was a nightmare. <laughs> Lesson learned. Jenny, I haven't got a question, but can I thank you for giving us such a um, precise, logical, explanation of a process that's worked for you? Well, I hope it works for you because when I was asked to do it, I thought, why are you asking me? I'm a scientist. I'm not a teacher. Um, yeah, so I'm happy to hear that it's useful. So I guess probably the thing I can say is if you find the, the template difficult as I do, mm -hmm. just go and do it in your own form in a way that you're comfortable with bearing in mind, yes, it will create some more work for you and actually then putting it into their template. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Good luck. Very good advice. Yes. <laughs> Thank okay. you, Jenny. Any, any more questions? Okay. Diane, are you ready to um, share your wisdom as well? Um, Jenny, would you like to unshare your screen? I will do. Have I Thank unshared you. it? No, um, no. That's oh. better. That's better. Done it now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Kia ora, everyone. Uh, hang on. I'm just going to find my screen. Hopefully, this is it. And, ah, here we go. Excellent. Okay. So, is that showing for everybody? Yes, thank you. It is for okay. me, yeah. Cool. Um, so I haven't had as many successes as Jenny has. Um, I've had, I've applied for two Curious Minds grants and been lucky enough to receive those. There was one last year and one in 2016 that um, we received. And for some bizarre reason, my PowerPoint is not working while I'm on the screen. Any tips, Michael? It should be. It should work just as a normal PowerPoint if you um, click to change the... There we go. There okay. you are. That's right. There we go. Um, so a lot of this is similar to what Jenny's already said. Go into MB and download the proposal document now and... I did that as soon as it came online and I've got these key dates up on my wall front and center because it has changed from the last time I applied with the two dates that you now have the registration which ends on the 21st 21st of August at noon and then we have until the 18th of September at noon so really really important to keep that timeline in mind 
Um, I actually asked the person who was our advisor at MB and said, okay, I've been asked to do this. What are your suggestions? This is what I think. What do you think? And so this is a bit of a joint um, presentation, I suppose, of both of our ideas. One of the pieces of feedback that I've had from a lot of the STLP people who have come to visit us at school has been, we want to do, for example, a bio blitz. What did you do when you put in your um, application to MB for that? And they're not very keen on giving funding for repeat projects. And that's not just repeat within a school, that's a repeat of a project. And when I queried her on this, she said, well, that is written up in the way that the Curious Mind grants um, have been given to MB. So she said, that they won't be given to prop up programs that they would consider were already sustainable within a school. And they are definitely looking for innovative new things that will reach their target audiences. They said that you can use a proven methodology, but you have to be specific that that methodology is going to be used to approach a new audience and one of the target audiences. Start with a compelling story. So who are you encouraging to learn about science and technology and why are they a hard to reach audience? And I think that's a really critical point for this funding. Uh, so go to the question, why? Why are you doing this? So for us at Koranui School, we have a really high cohort of Māori and Pacifica, that's about 70% of our students. And those are the cohort that traditionally have a really poor representation in the science and technology sectors. But another why could be that you are a school that has very few science resources. Or you could be in a location where you have limited access to scientists or limited access to education outside the classroom providers. Do your budget really carefully. The template on the MB portal will step you through it when you get to it, but you really do have to do your homework early about the costs. And I hadn't thought of that contingency amount that Jenny was talking about. I think that's a brilliant idea. Because I know last year when we were running our bio blitz, I was absolutely paranoid that I was going to exceed the budget and leave the school, I don't know, five or $6,000 out of pocket. So in the end, I actually underspent. And when I did my final report, I wrote into MB and said, well, I have underspent but there was this section of the proposal that we didn't actually get to do. Are you okay with me keeping that money? And we will do it and I'll report to you on how we do it. And they've agreed to that. So that's something that we're gonna finish off later on this year. You've also got to make really sure that your budget's accurate and that it reflects the amount of money that you're asking for. Um, that was, a, that was something that Katrina had said to me that quite often people will put in a budget and they'll say, well, we would like $30,000, but then their budget might be for, I don't know, 21,000 or something and the two figures don't match. Think about your project leadership. Have a backup plan for it, just in case somebody leaves school or there's an illness or some other reason that the person who has written down as the project leader can't fulfill that job. And it's a really great opportunity to mentor other teachers so that they gain confidence in delivering science. Check that you've got the support that you need. And hang on, I've gone forward and I want to go back. Sorry. Um, so tonight we've got our Board of Trustee meetings. I have already submitted to our board. Are you okay with me putting in a proposal 
for this project. Make sure that your principal and your leadership team are on board with you and your wider staff and community, depending on your project, of course. And then as Jenny said, you've got to get out to your collaborators early, to the scientists, to the technologists, because they do have to ask permission, a lot of them, from their managers. And that can take a lot of time. And the other thing that I found a bit tricky, and I haven't been into the portal this year yet, was that I needed CVs for a lot of the people that were on my team. And not and teachers in particular were the, that were on the leadership team that I had built around our BioBlitz didn't have a current CV. So that was just a little something to keep in mind that, yeah, when you ask people if they're prepared to be involved, just say, and I might need a copy of your CV as well. Think about whether you've got some added benefit for your community. That non-formal education, is that going to complement whatever your project is and whatever you have happening in the classroom? And if it is, make a real focus of it in your application. Is any of your learning going to be cross-curricular? What curriculum areas are those that you're going to cover in the kaupapa of the project that you have on offer? And can you tick off all of the STEM subjects in your project that you are going to be presenting? And again, when Jenny presented hers, I hadn't thought of that link through to industry. So that's just given me another idea for something that I could include in a project presentation. Um, just a few practical tips. Again, the dates. If you're going to do it, get that registration in and then think a little bit deeper about what your project might be. Read the call for proposals carefully before you go into the portal. And really carefully read the assessment criteria and put yourself into the assessor's shoes. It doesn't matter how good your idea is, if you miss one of those critical steps, they're not going to look at your proposal. There are 10 assessors for the projects. Three of them read your proposal very carefully. The other seven will get your proposal and they will be asking questions about it to the three who've read it really carefully. So you have to have all 10 people on board with whatever your project is that you're presenting. Um, I find it really helpful to get a critical friend, critical friend and to give them that scoring criteria and my application ahead of time and ask them to read it against the assessment criteria and give me feedback. So 50% of the project is judged on the impact it's going to have and the other 50% is judged on excellence. So is there scientific rigour in your project? Is it good value for money for MB? And does it contribute to the Curious Minds Fund objectives and outcomes. And for that, I go back and I read the original um, Unlocking Curious Minds um, paper that was put out. And that's online. If you go into the proposals, that you can get a copy of that online. And page 16 in the call for proposals this year is where you'll find that list of what's important and what it's going to be assessed against. Um, and you need to give evidence that you are meeting the outcomes that you've put into your proposal. I like to work backwards. I like to sort out the why of the project. Why am I doing it? What am I hoping to achieve? And who have I made links with that I can utilize in my project? Then I think about how can I show that I've reached the target audience that I've identified? Is there qualitative and quantitative data that I can use as evidence? How am I going to show change? And for me anyway, how am I using the science capabilities? When you put your proposal in, 
plan for release time for yourself or whoever's on your lead team for your project. Don't be scared to pay the people that you need to support you with expertise if it's difficult to find that expertise in your area. So for my bio blitz, I couldn't find an entomologist. Um, so we ended up paying for somebody to come down from Waiuru. I also paid for people to come from Auckland and somebody to come from Dunedin because they had specific expertise that I needed and I couldn't find it locally. The reporting that you have to do is significant. I would love to have a Jenny who does the reporting <laughs> for me, <laughs> um, but I've had to do it all myself. Give yourself release time, and I'd say give yourself at least three days release time to do that reporting. Uh, and share the load. Get other people in your school to help you or in your community. And I guess if you've got a local branch of the Royal Society, ask them about it. <laughs> if they got a Jenny that they could lend us. Um, and here's my little bit of politics which probably the Wanaka people don't need to do, but agitate for the participatory science platform to be spread around the country. Four years that it's been in three areas and it's time to share the love. So there's Megan Wood's email and Chris Hipkins' email and just email bomb them. Why isn't this being shared around? Um, and let's just get more fantastic science going for all the kids in the country. And that's me, so any questions? Hi, Di, this is Sharon here. It's not really a question, but I just want to back up really what you just said about the PSP, because you know that's been so instrumental in, in our success, which we'll talk more about in a moment. But I was just wondering whether I um, have worked with Vic Metcalf uh, a little bit about PSP, and she was previously working for the ministry um, under this umbrella and trying to, and her aim was to spread it further. So I just, I'm not too sure. Last time I spoke to her, it was before the uh, election and she said it depended on what would happen. So I don't know if anybody knows whether Vic Metcalf is still involved with PSP, but I think that would be a good avenue to take as well to see where she's at with her, her mission to spread it further. Does um, anybody know? That's a really good idea, Sharon. Um, she is still involved. She's just sick of me nagging her. Yeah. <laughs> and so has said, can you talk to the ministers involved? Right. Um, okay. Yeah. But every now and again on Twitter, I just kind of poke at the bear and say, hey, why isn't this being shared around? It sounds yeah. amazing. Yeah, it is. And it's just, yeah, definitely. When we presented last year at the Primary Science Conference, there were lots of people interested in, in other areas to find out how could they get involved and have access to the PSP. So I think it's definitely a way to to go and move forward with this kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Hey Diane, that was really good from practical experience from a teacher. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was riveted by your presentation. Thanks a lot. Any more questions for Diane? Thank you, Diane. That's okay. And good luck everybody if you're having a go. I'm excited to read about some pretty interesting projects that people will be coming up with. Okay, if there's no more questions, Sharon and Karina, do you want to um, share your insights, please? Okay, I'm just trying to start my video and it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. I don't know. Hang on, there you go. Are we on? Hang on, there's Karina. Yeah. But my video won't start. Do you know why? It says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it on mine when I press start my video. Can you help, Michael? Can you hear me? I can hear you, Sharon. Okay. Yeah. And I can I just, hear you, Sharon. I just Sorry, can't start I, my video. I, I didn't have my um, microphone on. You're, okay. Can, I can see you, Karina. Can anybody else see you? Yep. Yes. It's Sharon here that's having trouble. I'm just saying you cannot, it says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Oh, oh Sharon. Yeah. Hang on. Let me just find you. Um, 
ask to start video. Yes, I can do that. <laughs> okay. There we, there we go. All right. <laughs> okay, start my video. Okay, good. Sorry. Okay. Is that all good? I wasn't sure who, which of you two was talking. Sorry, yes, it was me. <laughs> and I'll just go, hopefully, and share my pres share the presentation. Can Is that okay? Can everybody see that? Yeah, it's coming. Cool. Okay. So, um, basically, our experience is mainly around PSP and just citizen science in general. And we, um, we've been very fortunate. We've had quite a bit of success um, over the past two years. I um, did the STLP course in the beginning of 2016 and was placed with plant and food research. And at the same time, we were just growing our team of science leaders at one of the primary. We had a group of year fives and sixes who um, we were getting involved with various different projects in, in school and tried to connect with the things that was happening with science in our community. So um, as part of the SCLP, one of the things that we did was to take the children down to plant and food research where they had a, had a visit. And this is where the idea of the first PSP project that I applied for and was the lead teacher on project, lead project, whatever you call them, project manager, um, really stemmed from the children's interest of finding out more about how we can control coddling moth, which was a growing problem and still is really a problem in our area. So um, that was just one thing I think, I think that, help to um, trigger my drive to apply and it just happened to coincide at the same time that the first or a round of the PSP project um, was being trialled um, in Otago so I just thought well, well I'm not really sure what this is all about but I'll give it a go so I read all the information on the website. Um, I don't think I could have possibly got any further on my own though just found that Craig Grant who was the Central Otago facilitator for PSP was, was really helpful and it actually did encourage as part of that process just to email him originally with your initial thoughts or ideas so I put a couple of things out there not really expecting to um, have much success in a way and then um, Craig replied really positively and helped me really to shape and kind of co I felt like he coached me through the process of how to fill in an application for the PSP and he really was great in just reading drafts and making suggestions of where we needed to have more I mean basically the community involvement was a a big area that we needed to um, make more connections with with different people in the community and scientists in the community so we had Kate Colhoun from Plant and Food Research was our science partner and she did take a little bit of persuading as um, realising from listening to, to Jenny speak that obviously scientists are, you know, are busy people and to take on, on more work, even though however much the desire is there, it's something that they have to think about carefully. So I did find it was, I had to bring my persuasive um, talents to the fore, which I didn't realise I had until the STLP kind of helped me uh, develop some some resilience and some, um, yeah, whatever you want to call it, but just it to keep persuading her and, and finally thankfully she agreed to be involved so we also involved some other local scientists who were part of the University of the Third Age and retired scientists in our area to help with just some of the, the work that the children were doing to um, monitor in our communities so and we had lots of community involvement with the, the, the sites that we were monitoring were all local gardens some some parents and families of the school and, and others that were just interested we set out sent out an initial survey of people who maybe have issues with, with the coddling moth. So it was a big learning curve for me. I hadn't filled in applications of this kind before. Having to do, you know, just I'm just a primary school teacher and uh, just having yeah, to do the budgets. And that was way beyond my comfort zone and my experience. But it, it was really just a partnership really with Craig helping. He came to talk to, to me at school as well. And came up and met us so I really felt as though I was guided all the way through this this project which ended up being highly successful um, the children also um, just gained so much obviously from the from the science and working with other scientists um, so I put here that the ideas stemmed from our interest after our initial visit to PFR and we then we contacted Craig Grant who helped us firm up the plan and find ways to increase community engagement. The, the main three objectives of the PSP were that they're locally relevant, hold scientific value, 
and provide teaching and learners opportunities for those who get involved. So this to me sounded from what Di and Jenny were saying, just maybe less complicated than the, than the MBI, MB um, funding process. Um, the whole application form, even though it was, it was still tricky and had to have a lot of work and thought behind it, didn't seem quite so um, rigid. Um, and, it, and it was great to get that feedback from, from Craig as well. So yeah, so the communication with school management, obviously as Di spoke about as well, was a key factor in making sure that these things are successful and cooperation of, of colleagues, because um, a lot of the time it involved, it wasn't my own class, it was children who were being released from various classes. So we had to get that support from them. So that helped to make from the initial idea and thought that I had to, to enabling us to run a successful PSP project. And then from there, we, well, whilst I was doing the PSP project, really, I heard about Barbara Anderson's MoffNet project. So that was another, she originally had Curious Minds funding and then, oh, started out as a PSP project and then was extended into a Curious Minds project. She'd already been working with a few schools in various, in, in our area and around the South Island, but we hadn't been involved with their original study. I didn't really know anything about it, but I contacted Barbara basically and just said, look, we're also doing a project on MOFs and we decided we'd have a good chat together. It was a really good counterbalance for our students who were studying MOFs as pests. And this is, um, and Barbara's project was about native beneficial MOFs. So we thought, look, this is really great. So we, we agreed to had us on uh, to go down to the MOFnet conference and stay over. I took two pupils with me and um, it was just fabulous to, uh, again, just reaching out and just all those connections with different scientists, different organisations. And I just felt as though that was one of the key things really that is one of the benefits of whatever project you've got involved with and however you've started it, just to keep those connections going between other organisations, other scientists. We then went back and carried on the research at school. Um, so, and Barbara is always, always there at hand to, you know, we can borrow resources from her. We're still linked to the MoffNet site. So that's another great ongoing project. So um, just those connections. And I think again, just that persistence of, you know, finding out that somebody else has, is running something similar and just communicating with them about how can we get involved. That's been, I think, one of our successes. Um, and similarly, then the Touchstone project, we started to be involved with last year, and this stemmed from just a chance, um, the, a lab at the lake event one Sunday that I attended with my family. And I, as I was there, I was just talking to everybody, how can we get involved? How can we, you know, we, we need to involve our pupils. And uh, Craig, again, was quite instrumental in helping us with that because he knew that Chris Arbuckle, who was their project lead, he'd sent his draft application. And one thing that he'd been asked to do was to, um, just increase his community involvement. So Chris had never originally thought about using primary school children. So Craig just suggested to the two of us to start a conversation. So Chris came to school and met with Karina and myself and we talked to him about the science leaders and what we felt they could offer. Um, and then when we actually started to work with him on the project, um, they had their application accepted, which was great. They're involved with lots of different community organizations. And um, he was just blown away by how um, great it was to work with primary school pupils. He'd already um, tried to connect with a secondary school group and they still, they're still involved as well. But we've just grown and grown in strength with our partnership with Chris and the, their project has been extended for another year and we're continuing to, to work with him. So we've got, last year we had, so obviously our year six pupils have, have left now, last year's year six, and we've got another some of the year five pupils have continued to work with the project and we've got another group of children working through. And again, I just think the strength of that is the connections with different organisations, different people, and um, what we've... Um, and can I, sorry, Sharon, can I add to that too? Because um, like Sharon was saying about um, Chris not initially wanting to work with primary school students, um, that was the case, he was more keen to work with the secondary school. And it's this year because he's got um, a, he's been approved a second round of funding through the um, PSP Curious Minds. Um, he has come out and sort of said that it's the primary school that has actually had the biggest impact in terms of um, 
getting the community on board with his project because it's sometimes I think we look at it as primary school that we need to get these scientists on board and, and do all the selling to them and actually he's discovered that it's helped him with his project which is to sort of clean up the lake and it's helped him have the kids on board because they really, really um, go out into the community and they're getting parents talking and um, they're getting the you know, the council are happier to listen because kids are doing the proposal as opposed to adults. So um, what we've found is really successful is um, it's been a great partnership because Chris is seeing the benefit to him that having kids on board can, um, what that can do. So, sorry, I just wanted to add yeah, that. That's great. No, it's great. Thanks, Karina. Um, yeah, so as Karina says, it's, and the, the we're, we're so lucky that there are such great projects in our community and I think one of the key things is is just trying to make connect into that and see what's happening in your own community um, and is there finding a way of, of, of connecting it with what's already happening and so Chris had already got a great project up and running and as Karina said it was just it's been a great partnership that's that's hopefully going to continue for, for a long time um, and from there just another project that we, we've also then Karina and I haven't been helping so much with the, the Touchstone project, we've given it over to, to Marcus, who's another one of our science leaders. And I know Di touched on the fact of just using other colleagues and, and strengthening their expertise. So um, Marcus, after working, and he's still working with the Touchstone project and with those children, but he's also then got involved with a, another local project that's just started, which is the Wanaka Backyard Trapping. Um, they haven't received any funding as such yet. It's just totally community driven and he's hoping that maybe that will be funded at some point um but yeah just another example of how just getting involved with one project creates links and connections so that you can then perhaps extend and, and look at other opportunities um it just feels as though it's been some kind of domino effect that we keep um yeah but it's just a bit of resilience and persistence to to keep looking for those projects that are out there and that are already running it's just another way of doing things if you haven't got if you're not able to make your own application for funding yourself and um, it's a good way just to still connect with great science that's happening in your community um so the way to next so karina after doing her stlp i'll let her speak about her um experience with applying for funding too um, okay. over to you um, so i can i guess i can provide a slightly different side of the story of what it's like to not have your funding approved um at the start of this year i went through that psp process um I built quite a good relationship up with NIWA, um, the atmospheric branch in Lauder, and um, they've been wonderful. They're quite keen to get on board to do some community outreach, and so I um, reached out to them and said, hey, can we do some stuff together? And that was great. Everything was going well. Um, I got a few other local health people, op optometrists, the Cancer Society, um, and had a project that I applied for the funding and it was declined. So um, I guess, at, you know, the first thought is pretty disappointing because you've just spent hours and hours. These funding projects are, are massive. Um, so I guess for, you know, a while there, I was sort of, oh, it's a waste of time. But um, I think the big thing is if you do get declined, it's sort of you have to step away from it for a couple of weeks and just clear your head and then you realise actually, and I think um, I've had the benefit of having Sharon getting the funding and seeing how wonderful it is um, and knowing that you can't give up, you've just got to keep trying. Um, so I've been going back um, to Craig and asking, you know, well, what can I do? Asking for feedback. Um, and he's been great at providing it. And there's been a little bit more funding come through, not the, the full amount that I wanted, uh, but that I'm able to apply for again. So I've made changes uh, to the project. And I've also look, gone, looked into some other avenues. I've got the principal very much on board with the project. We're very, you know, we're really, really keen to get it, the, give it the go ahead. So we've run a few other places. Um, Curious Minds isn't the only place out there that provides money. So we've rung a few in the area, some who can just provide money for equipment and not release um, as such. So we're sort of weighing up which one to go to first in terms of getting the money. Um, but I thought it was interesting that um, what Diane said about 
ensuring that it's something unique and different. And I've put here finding shared values because I firmly believe that my project was as topical as it needed to be. Like I was very excited about UV rays and, and trying to protect kids from skin cancer and stuff. Um, so I, you know, I had just went into it feeling fairly confident that others would have agreed. And it turns out that one of the reasons I was declined is because they couldn't see the distinction strong enough between the some smart stuff that happens throughout schools in New Zealand anyway. Um, so that was something they gave me feedback and they said it needs to be really, really unique. Um, so that was, well, I guess that was interesting to me. So I think, you know, that backs up what Diane says. If you got something you need to sort of go in and think well how is this going to be different to everybody else's what am I going to do and um, they keep coming back to me saying I need to get more of the community on board um, I feel like I've got a lot already but I still you know it's much more ringing around which is something that STRP was good for was good for me because it helped me get a bit brave with reaching out to people in the community and but it's also, I guess, for me too, because this has been, I applied at the start of the year. Um, we're now halfway through and I'm still fine looking for money everywhere that I can. Um, and it's keeping me we're on board as well because they're a wonderful group and they've been excellent um, in terms of, um, you know, saying, yes, we'll do this for you. And they've volunteered a lot of their time without asking for the money. Um, but I'm also conscious of the fact that I'm emailing them every few weeks saying, is it still okay? Can I put forward this project? Um, and they're very good about it. So it's just, um, I'm very lucky in that respect. But for me, it's just, I guess the message is, if you're not successful the first time, don't give up. You, I do think you need to walk away from it for a few weeks to clear your head because it is disheartening. Um, but um, keep going because it's, I've seen through the pro, um, projects that we have done how valuable they are for the kids. Um, and I think, Karina, would you agree that um, having us both, you know, both committed to it, you know, we can, I can provide you support, even if it's just moral support, you know, we can yeah. so have that partnership and I mentioned that as well, about having other people to work with on the staff, not taking it on board all by yourself is, is really valuable because it helps you just... Oh, absolutely. And it's having staff and also wendy the principal is very very on board with it so um so you yeah, will keep going i'll find some money somewhere <laughs> so that was just my last slide there which just i tried to summarize the reasons for our success with citizen science i've put in general not just the psp funding and as di pointed out we are very very lucky that ours is one of the regions that does have psp funding because that has really been um the the reason the the key reason that what, what for us to get started on this on this line really of getting involved with citizen science so just communication connecting with our community that tenacity resilience and persistence and just involving the whole school our school of now we've been doing a deep learning um little learning about it's good new pedagogies for deep learning so the whole school have developed a bit more of an understanding about the importance of how citizen science fits into that because it fits in with with our with our vision for the school so so that's been fabulous to get the whole school involved with various looking out for citizen science projects small or, or large that they can get involved with so and the people engagement so yeah that's us and we shall keep hopefully being in, involved in lots of whatever projects we can we can find we will do our best to just yeah look at the value of each one and connect where we can Thank you, that was great. Lovely to see the um, breadth and depth of the um, links that you're making and the importance of um, mutual support and so on. Thank you so much. Have we got any questions specifically for the people um, from Wanaka, for Sharon and Karina? Uh, it's not a question, but it's just looking at um, what you were saying, Karina, um, it, it's more a, we need to actually just suck it up and talk to each other. And I think that, um, yes, okay, it, it says, you know, yes, you have to have a unique project. And, and so for that reason, we kind of think, oh, I better not tell anybody about it. 
but actually together we're much stronger and we come up with better projects and I think we just have to trust each other and say this is my idea for a project what do you reckon and just trust each other that we'll all honour the fact that oh, okay well that one's their idea they can submit that and this is our idea and we can submit this Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's um, I guess for me it was it's it's more just sort of not assuming that um that your values are going to be shared um by the the people who are going through the um looking at the applications, but rather really drill in and what it is they're asking you to do. So if they're asking you to make those community connections, make as many as you can, and um rather than just hanging on the hope for me that, that the project is going to be um, something that everyone has the same values with, R rather than that, really drill in on what it is they're asking you to do. It's what I'm learning through the process anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, I was astounded when they told me that there are 10 assessors for the Curious Minds proposals, and I was like, 10? <laughs> wow. Um, and that, that just gave me a whole different picture of how accurate and detailed I need to be and how much research I need to put in. And yeah, when you're teaching full time, that's really tricky. So I'm, I'm just really yeah. jealous of you guys who've got your PSP person to kind of guide you along. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can people hear me? It's Jen here. Hi, Jen. Hi. How are you all? I'm so proud of you. I'm sitting here smiling through my snot. I've got a cold. <laughs> um, look, I just want to say, um, apart from um, what wonderful um, insights into what you're doing, um, we've been doing some thinking about this um, at the STLP headquarters at the Royal Society Te Aparangi. And what we're going to um, be launching in the next few weeks is um, we've been thinking about actually how we can actually um, facilitate networking within local communities. So rather than just getting people together um, from um, um, other participant teachers in an area, we think a better use of funding may be to put some targeted phase two funding which schools um, can apply for where they can use to start making these connections that may end up in a um, formal application for some funding. You've all talked about how time poor you are, so we're thinking that that might be a really good use of our phase two funding to support you with the process. Excuse me, Jen, it's quite hard to hear you. Can you hear you, me now? Yeah, your, your, your volume was a bit low. Yeah, hang on, I'll put, put it up a bit. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're trying to. What we're trying to do is have. Um, we're going to be sending some emails out in the next week or so, and um, asking schools who are interested in um, putting forward a proposal. Um, it won't be lots of money, but it might be enough for you to make connections or have time to make connections with local scientists, um, people in communities to have conversations about putting together some ideas for projects that you may want to then get um, some funding for. So we thought that would be a really good use of our phase two funding. Yeah, I agree. Um, rather than just getting you all together for a nice afternoon um, at some place, um, which would be lovely, but actually let's think about what the, what the whole point of STLP is, one of the key things is actually getting those connections with local communities. So let's target some funding for you to do that. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea, idea Jen, because I think especially the further out you are from STLP and the more you want to branch into different areas of science, yep. the harder it is to make those connections with yep. a completely new group of people. Absolutely. So it, it, so we'll be sending something out, um, out to you soon and we don't know what it's going to look like, but it's all a bit of an adventure. So we're quite excited. Yeah, it sounds great, Jen. I know once, I can't remember, I was on another webinar once, um, it was probably about six months ago, and somebody talks about the idea of if, for example, uh, projects like PSP, it works really so well to have someone like Craig Grant that's the regional coordinator, and whether there was a, a place for a role of maybe a teacher who could then maybe 
be have an area where you are the person that tries to connect schools with scientists and that kind of thing. I don't know how feasible that would be, but it's well, it like suddenly, a good thing. everybody suddenly, was happy there. <laughs> um, that is actually one of the other things we've been thinking about. So um, what we are going to, but again, we I mean we haven't got huge amounts of dosh to do this, but what we're no. thinking is there might be there might be a group of you to get together in one particular area and say like um, I might put a proposal in that we could for six months or three months, I'm just making this up really, could release someone for a day a week or something to do that brokering and connecting. Yeah, yeah. So what we're trying to do is, um, is you know, we're hearing the same stories over and over again and we've got all these wonderful examples of these resilient uh, people like yourself, you know, really attempting to make things happen but we're thinking what can our program actually actively do to give you the time and resources to make that easier for you yeah so that's what we're going to do we don't know. Yeah, yeah definitely. it's very exciting sounds great it's me. Yeah, sounds good right cam i think you've got your hand up do you want to say something Hi, Redka. Hello. Finally. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no. The hands up was when you asked us to okay. just know that if we are here. So no, no. I've been carefully listening. It was amazing. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Hello, Karina. <laughs> okay. Any more thoughts, questions, observations? I'm amazed at the richness of what you different people are doing. I was unaware of what, what a hub of activity Wanaka is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we're so lucky every year we get NASA that comes to our airport as well. So every time, although this year was the first year they've not launched the balloon, but we're, every, every time we hear of something like that, we go, okay, NASA are here. Get the yeah, yeah. You know, anything. We just uh, keep our ears out and keep our, yeah, our feelers out for, there's so much science happening in our little community. It's, uh, it's amazing, really, once you start digging and delving into what's going on. So who's going to be the, the lucky? Did you, did who's going to be the lucky STLP to um, have NASA as their host? Wow, <laughs> that would be cool. <laughs> did you see the eclipse? I missed it. No, I missed it. Did you see it, Karina? Um, yes, I did. I saw the start of it, but then because it was so low in the horizon, it dropped below the mountains. <laughs> oh, right. Mm. Okay, I've got a personal question of, of you guys in Wanaka before, before we finish. What's the best way to deal with coddling moth? Well, there's no simple answer to that, but there's, a, there's various, it's, it's really nobody has found a, um, a fail-safe method. Plant and Food Research were trialling um, a wasp, a parasitic wasp, which um, pre basically parasitises the, the larvae. And so they were trialling that in some orchards, but the problem with that is it has to be, it's a little bit too cold for it, for it to thrive. And it was a, that was the thing that hooked the children in in the first place, watching a, a video of this uh, wasp injecting the, the larvae and, uh, and then eating them from inside out. And when they, they just, that, that, it was a real true gore horror. And that was what hooked them in in the first place. So yes, I was, but basically in our community, it's still just a case of, um, Pheromone traps and oh, it's just very complicated. I haven't got a quick and easy answer for you, Michael. Right, we, right. <laughs> we we have persistent problems with our one apple tree, but uh, yeah. Okay. Any other questions or thoughts before we wind up for the evening? Um, are you going to load the webinar on the Facebook page, Michael? It's just up. I hope if the recording has worked, it will um, do that. It's, it looks as though it's still recording, so I will be doing that within the next twenty four forty eight hours. Okay. And I'll let you know. I'll flick you an email if you like. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for organising yeah. it and hosting yeah. us. Thank, Thank you, everybody, for taking part. It's just excellent. It's been great. Been been wonderful to hear you and, and to participate. So take care. Keep warm. <laughs> All righty. We'll Bye see you everyone. again. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye.